Gaza may be facing a collapse of its humanitarian system as donor countries pull funding from the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, a crucial provider of aid both before and after October 7th. Thus far, at least 26,000 Gazans have been killed and another 1.7 million have been displaced. So why, during a time of crisis, have countries pulled the funding? And what will happen to civilians who depend on the agency for survival? Here to speak with us about this is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory Occupied Since 1967, Francesca Albanese. Francesca, thanks so much for joining me on Upfront. Uh, Israel has accused 12 UNRWA employees of being involved in the October 7th attacks against Israel. Uh, the UN has said that it's investigating these serious allegations. But since then, at least... A dozen countries, including the United States, Germany, the U.K., have already stopped giving funding to the agency. Uh, U.N. officials have warned that the loss of the funding could lead to a collapse of the humanitarian system. Uh, from your perspective, uh, what impact would this have on the people? Um, thank you for having me, Mark. Um, first of all, I think that we should unpack this the suspension of, uh, of funds. And to my knowledge, the number of countries who have uh, done so has reached 18 right now. And this is absolutely shocking. And it's not justifiable. Apparently, I mean, we, we have not seen the, the evidence, but there are allegations that um, 12 staff members of UNRWA have participated in the 7th of October attacks. Um, UNRWA, without even ensuring due process, has terminated the contracts of, uh, of these people in the interest of the agency, as the Commissioner General said. Again, the, the, the logic of suspending funds, given the fact that at the United Nations, UNRWA has already taken measures, taken very seriously these allegations, makes no sense whatsoever. And also because it's going to lead uh, to a humanitarian catastrophe worse than what we are seeing already with the risk of famine looming on the Gaza Strait and with the risk of diseases which are already spreading, becoming even worse and killing more people. The Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator of the UN, uh, Martin Griffith, has, uh, has said Withdrawing funds from UNRWA is perilous and would result in the collapse of the humanitarian system in Gaza, with far-reaching humanitarian and human rights consequences, not only in Gaza, in the occupied Palestinian territory, but also across the region, because we shall not forget that UNRWA operates in, uh, in Jordan, in Syria, in Lebanon, and including in the, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Um, so bottom line is that Israel would have to take immediate responsibility for the 2.3 million survivors in, in Gaza. And this is not a reassuring prospect, given the reported level of violence against civilians, but also in the rest of the occupied Palestinian territory. So in light of the picture you just painted, the gross humanitarian consequences... The, the, the violence, the displacement, the disease, the, the, the potential famine. If all of that is going to happen as a consequence of the alleged crimes of 12 people in UNRWA, would that not amount to collective punishment? It does. This was my first assessment when I, when I heard this. Because, first of all, as I, as I said, it makes no, no sense, logically, to punish the agency for something that has been allegedly done by a few members of the organization. You know, UNRWA has a very thorough uh, vetting process, but, it, I mean, what is expected to do? It doesn't have uh, policing tools and like no other agencies has. So it's, it's very unrealistic to expect that UNRWA could check in an environment as tense as that of the Gaza Strip, which has been under blockade for 16 years and which has suffered five major wars before the 7th of October, where there is a lot of tension and where Hamas is de facto the ruling authority. It's, it's illogical. But also... But can, actually, for, for, could you say a little bit more about that vetting process, though? Because there are people in the global community 
who have accepted the logic and the narrative that UNRWA actually is very indiscriminate in the Palestinians that they hired to work on the ground uh, for UNRWA, particularly in the Gaza Strip, uh, and that it's just a, a breeding ground for, for these types of things. Uh, how, how would you respond to that? What is, what is, it like? what is the vetting process like? Um, no, look, I think that there has been... Um, okay. these, uh, these allegations against UNRWA are part of an, an attack against the agency that dates uh, back uh, decades. And it has intensified as of the 7th of October. There has been incre increasing smearing of the agency, uh, associating it to Hamas, and including parliamentarians in, the, in Israel saying that the only way to ensure victory would imply destroying UNRWA. As I said, in general, UN humanitarian agencies cannot vet local personnel for militancy. But UNRWA does background checks uh, when, uh, when it, assume, when it um, recruits uh, its staff, and it has uh, 13,000 13, staff members in Gaza, serving 1.7 million uh, Palestinians. So 75% of the Palestinians in Gaza are UNRWA beneficiaries. Of course, UNRWA cannot monitor staff actions outside the work. At the same time, um, UNRWA has a strong scrutiny uh, over the personnel it hires. And in fact, every six months, the names of both staff members and beneficiaries and vendors are circulated to all um, host states, including Israel. And so if even Israel didn't have information concerning any possible wrongdoings committed by UNRWA staff, because had it had it, it would have passed to the agency. How can UNRWA be blamed right now? So it seemed to me an orchestrated campaign against, against UNRWA. So the allegations against UNRWA were made public on the same day that the ICJ ruled on provisional measures in South Africa's genocide case against Israel. Uh, is that a coincidence? Do you want me to be honest or diplomatic? Honest, I believe. I'll take the honest, yeah. <laughs> Look, I, it, it's, of course, it was striking. It was striking that the day after the, um, the ICJ ruling, there was this news circulating, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a number of member states, the U.S. first and foremost, uh, decided to suspend uh, to suspend the aid to the agency. So it can be read as a way to shift the attention away from the ICJ genocide interim order. And again, it could be also seen as part of a long-standing effort of Israel to annihilate the agency. They, and this is something that dates back, as I said, to the post-Oslo agreement. This is not something new. But at the same time, what shocks me is the it's not necessarily the maneuvering, possible maneuvering from Israel. What I find shocking is the response by member states, because cutting funds to UNRWA at a moment that is existential for millions of Palestinians in Gaza who are enduring catastrophic living conditions. Help me, help me, help me understand that, that, those member states, because, again, if it were even just the United States... Or if Israel just made the call and no one responded to, to, to the request to cut UNRWA funds, it would be less shocking. But again, we're talking about more than a dozen countries suspending the funding before the investigation is completed. How do they... How is that justified? How do you make sense of that? It makes... Again, it, it, it cannot be justified. It's so, it's so immoral, irresponsible, but also it might have serious legal implications. For, this, for these states. Uh, and again, on the one hand, there is the fact that some of Israel's actions have been already found by the ICJ plausibly constituting genocide. Uh, this implies legal responsibility for member states because basically the ICJ has alerted the international community of the risk of genocide in Gaza, and it has ordered immediate and effective action. So they have to take all actions in their power to prevent Israel from continu continuing what might constitute genocide. And the second is to, um, to ensure that they do not aid and abet with, uh, with illegal acts, and they might be seen as complicit 
with acts of genocide. So instead of ensuring that humanitarian aid is delivered, is, is even strengthened, no, what they do is they take action castigating the agency that provides critical support to millions of Palestinians in this threat. How do you make sense of that? I mean, you, you point out the paradox in this huge contradiction. How do these powerful nations arrive at the conclusion that this makes sense? I've seen a number of countries um, announcing that they will consider restating aid. Well, it's not sufficient. They shouldn't have done it in the first place. Now they should uh, release the funds uh, as soon as possible. Um, I don't know what they are telling themselves. I have no idea. But I hope that civil society and the people of the people of this country will will take action themselves against the government. This is not the time to be silent. Again, um, the international community has proven unable unable to prevent genocides in in other occasions. It has happened in Rwanda. It has happened in Bosnia Herzegovina. But this is unique, as the status of South Africa has, uh, has said before the International Court of Justice, because this is a genocide that is being televised and documented by the, ver the very victims. And the lack of empathy, the lack of empathy is the, toward these people shown by primarily, but not only, Western countries is abysmal. And this represents such a, this is such a watershed moment, Mark, because it is, um, it's clear that there is a huge divide that is not so just symbolic between the West and the rest, where there is also a gray area where, in my view, Arab countries have not done enough either to protect the Palestinians. But again, international law is being completely dismantled, whatever the international, um, international law-based system can do to protect uh, the life of, of people in danger and to ensure peace and stability for all is being completely dismantled. And this is, um, <laughs> this is shocking, of course. Francesca Albanese, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Thank you. All right, everyone, that is our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.